I'm very pleased to have with us three people from the Society of Broadcast Engineers. You know, people look at a TV program and they never think about what goes into that TV program. Or you listen to a radio station, you never think about what makes the sound come out of that radio. Well, there are people that don't, I don't think, get enough publicity. They, they do their job very quietly and crises come up and they handle them and uh, every now and then you may you may yell at the TV set but these guys are the ones that make things happen and there's an organization called the Society of Broadcast Engineers and with me today are, are three of those members. One is Gino Rigadelli, um, the second is uh, Tom Siglin, and the third is Scott Phillips. Uh, let me just start off by asking you to give a little of your background um, uh, uh, as part of the uh, Society of Brass Engineers. Uh, how did you get into it, Rick? Just well, briefly. I, I, I got into it when Charlie Hallinan and uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Rissi and I, we heard from this uh, consulting engineer who had written an uh, article in his magazine saying that he thinks we ought to start a uh, society just for broadcast engineers. Okay, now at the time you were a television engineer, is that correct? No, I was a radio engineer. Okay, okay, Tom. And a, and a television engineer. All right, Tom, what's your background then? My background as a junior in high school got introduced as a cameraman into the educational TV system for the school district. And that turned to a job for 12 years in production uh -huh. for educational TV programs. And a couple years after uh, becoming a full-time staff member, I was introduced to the SBE. Okay. Scott? Well, being in the repair, repair and service industry for a long time, um, there was an opportunity that opened up for WINR to do uh, radio engineering, and uh, I took it upon me, and again with Charles Hallinan, uh, he was my mentor. He's the one that really pushed me to, to learn. Because up to that point, I had really not an idea. I had an idea, but um, it became very interesting. And I just followed up on it. Okay. All right. So, uh, Rick, give us a background then on the Society of Broadcast Engineers. How, how did this come about? Okay. The first thing we want to talk about is there was an organization called the Institute of Radio Engineers, okay. which we broadcasters were members of, and we were we were part of a large organization called the Institute of Radio and Electronic Engineers. But unfortunately, most of the members were uh, industrial type engineers. They had nothing to do with broadcasting, so. This consultant, his name was John Battison, he sent out 5,000 letters to all the radio engineers and TV engineers trying to promote a society of broadcast engineers. And so in 1964, at the NAV convention, uh, the society was formed, okay? And a few months later, Charles Hallinan, this fellow Joe Rissi used to work for me, um, and myself applied for membership and we created Chapter One. Okay. So when that was the beginning of the society, and then after that we had other 
uh, engineers from radio stations and TV stations, as far as Elmira and Ithaca. And uh, we had a group of about 25 at that time. And, uh, so there were th three of you started originally? Yep. And, and so you became uh, the Society of Broadcast Engineers, Chapter One. One. Yeah. Wow. And then Chapter Two was Scranton Wolfsburg. Oh. That was the second chapter. Okay. And uh, I don't I don't mean to get ahead of you, That's but all right. so it started out with Binghamton and Scranton. Yeah. And how many are there today? Right, let's see. I have to look at my notes. I think there are 114 chapters now. Wow. And they're all located in. Canada, uh, Pakistan, uh, Hong Kong, and Puerto Rico. There are chapters there, and they work with the main, with the rest of us. Um, so that's how it got started, and then the three of us were became charter members at the time. Okay, and. Uh, so, because at one time, <clears throat> the, the three of us uh, used to have lunch once a month, and that's before we became, you know, society uh, engineers, uh, and we decided that it would be great to have this, this society, and then we invited all our technical people to become members. So now this is like in the early 60s then, right? Yeah. Okay. What did you talk about when you went to lunch? Oh, we talked about our problems. We had another thing. We used to um, loan each other test equipment because budgets for test equipment is always pretty low. Uh -huh. And so if one guy had a piece that, you, that another guy needed, we just loan each other equipment. And that was one of the reasons we had these lunches for. And then we discussed each other's problems and, you know, we. Then we had some fellowship uh, thing, but the society became grew pretty rapidly after that, and uh, all sorts of things began to happen. Let me interrupt at this point and ask Tom: How many members are there now? Members in our organization, yeah, in the local organization, oh, seventeen. 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 <clears throat> That's for this chapter. But we do invite non-members to participate as well. Oh, I see. So we have. Uh, friends that show up and occasional drop-in visitors that, that uh, attend the meetings for uh, either the program, uh, sometimes the program is really exciting, other times it's, it could just be a discussion amongst the members, yeah. but uh, nonetheless it's, uh, it's open to uh, anyone to drop in. Okay. I'm sorry Rick, I didn't mean it's to okay. interrupt you at that no, point. But. All right, the, uh, the other thing that happened was we had uh, what we call yearly conventions where exhibitors came in and showed their products and we had uh, various workshops keeping up what was going on technologically in our in our I, I was just telling, asking asking will to zoom in on you I, I didn't mean to be directing from, from the right. chair over here but do uh, whatever you have to do <laughs> 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 so uh, uh, one, one more thing. Will, are you a member of this organization? No. Oh, okay. I was going to. No, I was in the video end of it. I was in uh, the production end. Oh, okay. Will, uh, Will Rickenberg is our, uh, is our cameraman on, our camera crew on this <laughs> one. Okay. And so we had these conventions. And the first convention we had, Chapter One did it in a Wego. It was fairly small. It had a few exhibitors and. So we then decided that we didn't have a big enough organization to continue having these conventions, so it went to Syracuse, and Syracuse has been doing them ever since. In fact, there's going to be a, a thing, I think it's September 25th, at uh, Turning Stone, which is a mm -hmm. thing out there. And for all west of Syracuse, east of Syracuse. So this gives you a chance then to see what's new and and, uh, and, and also get information from people who are dealing with things. Because one of the things that society was, has been doing is keeping engineers up to date with the technology. Because when you, when you think about it, society started when we just had 
radio and some television. So uh, society would always give you all the latest technology. One of the interesting things was I went to a workshop in Syracuse. It was on digital television, 10 years before we actually got into television, wow. digital. Because many engineers at that time said it's never going to happen. <laughs> because they said it would be too expensive to buy a TV set. Uh, and people wouldn't, wouldn't just do that, wouldn't get rid of their, their TV sets to buy something else. Well, as history has shown, people who had old sets were able to get a, a thing from the government to get a converter. So that really gave the digital broadcasting a shove. Um, then, then the society started to have what we call a certification program. There are 13 levels of certification. What you do is you take an exam and you pass the exam and you get certified whatever level you were going after, okay? So there are 13 levels now. Originally there were only four and uh, certification and uh, I've been the chairman of the certification for 30 years, wow. but I only had two, two sessions <laughs> in that 30 years because a lot of engineers are afraid of failing the test, okay? That's the reason, one of the reasons they don't take the test, okay? Well, what, uh, what's the advantage in well, taking the, the test? The advantage is if you're going to go find a job, some of the managers use that certification uh -huh. as one of the steps to to decide whether they're going to hire you or not, because they know that that gave you an educational background that you... What, what does it take to become an engineer? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, well uh, 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 Tom and, and Scott were talking about how they, they sort of grew up yeah, with this well, stuff. That, that, that's usually what happens. In but, your young life, you get a, you get a, you know, a, a, you see things happening in radio, particularly when I was doing it, because I can remember as a teenager, I built what we call a crystal set uh -huh. using a, a oatmeal, box. oatmeal box for the coil, and then a thing called a crystal that had a little wire, and you had to play with it, and they called it a cat's whisker, okay? And I was picking up, since I lived across from Hudson, at the Hudson River in New York, I could get the New York station. So, yeah. so that, that started me thinking about it, because what really, I started out, I was going to become a musician, okay? I was played the violin since I was eight years old until I was 20 or something. And, uh, and when I decided I wanted to go into electronics and tell my mother about this, she almost fell off the chair because she thought she spent all this money on my education, <laughs> and I was just throwing that away. You know? So that's how how you get started. And most of the people that I hired and worked with usually got started in, in playing around with electronic, mostly ra little radios, because radios went from tubes to transistors. And that, that sort of gets you an interest. So well, that's how you get started. So what about today, Rick, what, or, or Tom, or, or Scott? What, what about today? Where, are young people doing the same thing then? Or do they, they, do they go to formal schools for it? They, they have an avenue where their personal interest takes them into the electronic field. And in the case of the Binghamton market, they have an additional possibility in that the Binghamton University has a radio station. And so they get introduced to that by chance or by design. And some of that familiarity brings them into the engineering aspect of the, of the radio broadcasting field. Mm -hmm. And from there, the, the studio, which has about 225 people involved, then feeds those students to the local radio stations as part-time people. And a number of them have gone on to careers in, the, in professional broadcasting. That is just astonishing. Right. Our, uh, uh, Rick, you're, I guess you're the only one here that's still in 
in broadcasting, right? No, right. Are, still, are you still? I'm still doing engineering. Uh, with uh, the uh, Bingham, uh, BU. W oh, BU. Oh, okay. And Scott, so you were doing? I was doing WINR, right? Oh, you're working with uh, WINR? Well, I was. And, oh, okay. Uh, well. But see, my background, if I can just yeah. add a little flavor, I did things differently. I was able to get into uh, Link Aviation, and I worked at Links for many years. Worked in power supply inspection and repair, and uh, was fortunate enough to get liaison work done in New York City and New Jersey. And uh, so courtesy of Link, um, I was able to come in the back door a certain way because I met a lot of people. And that got me interested in radio and TV. And later on, although I was always interested from uh, age eight on, uh, able to a uh, radio TV servicing place and facility in, in Binghamton. We actually had one in Windsor too and another one in Hillcrest. And consolidated and made everything into one. But that was a formation for me to go on to a different avenue. Not that servicing wasn't great. My follow-up question here is, <clears throat> are there as many people in engineering in like in the Binghamton market today as there were, say, 20 years ago? No. No? Mm -hmm. No. no. Well, what's the reason for that? Well, the reason is the stations and the equipment, first of all, the equipment has gotten very reliable, okay? Therefore, you don't deal with problems. In the early days, the minute you came in in the morning, there was always a list of six or eight things that went haywire and you had to deal with it. But, uh, but today, there's a shortage, by the way, of transmitter engineers because most of the engineers are enthralled with the studio because the studio's got all the toys and all the wonderful stuff and they don't concentrate on, uh, on the transmitter and a lot of them younger engineers believe that someday we're not going to need transmitters okay because they say it's going to all be on the internet or it's going to be by some other means well, that's a long ways down the road, but that's the thinking. So, therefore, they don't get interested in, in transmitter work at all. But when I, you mentioned the internet and, and, and this kind of thing, we see these towers all over the place with the, the telephone towers. Don't they need work? Yeah. yeah. But it's plug again, and play. It's not. Oh, is it plug it? Did, to take one piece out, put another piece in. Yeah, right? it's not. It's not. You don't repair anything anymore. Now, you, if your piece of equipment goes out of whack, uh, you see the board, and the manufacturer sends you a board. You put the board in, and that's the end of the right. problem. Back in the early days, you actually had to get in there with a soldering iron and tools and so forth. Because one of the interesting things that I remember going to an RCA color seminar down at RCA in Camden, and the engineer came up with a very good story. He said it took us 40 years to learn radio tubes. It's taking us now five years to learn transmitter technology, okay? He said at the rate we're going with the technology and what, the, what you have to do to understand it, he says, it's very possible you come in in the morning at 9 o'clock and by the time you go home at 5 o'clock, the technology has already changed. <laughs> um, that was his outlook because it was going so fast. And it's true today. Today the digital technology is, I mean, you, you pick up all this information that's out there. There's always somebody working on something. Yeah. So that's, that's really what, where we are today as far as engineers are concerned. Well, if there was a young guy that said, geez, I'd like to be a, a transmitter engineer, yeah. how would he go about doing that? Well, first of all, he has to go someplace to get an education. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to have electronic education. There's no question about that. Any engineer who, who has gone from, let's say, operating to engineering has had to go. Now, most of the engineers in the broadcast business went to technical school. They didn't go to college. They went to technical school. And that's how they got their education. Because I can tell you, 
how I got blind. When I got out of high school, my father sat me down one night and said, I haven't got any money to send you to college. So I said, that's, I understand that, because it was a depression, you know. Uh -huh. So. This was in the late 30s, then? Oh, no, this is in the early 40s. Early 40s. I got out of high school in 1940. So the first thing I said to myself, I want to get into electronics. How am I going to get the education? Well, because the war was, was apparently coming on, this is before Pearl Harbor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt got a program where at night schools, at high school, they had courses in electronics. It didn't cost you a dime. All you had to do was show up. Okay? So that started me getting my background. And then from there, I went to that school. Uh, I had to travel all the way to the Bronx. I lived in, in New Jersey. It took me an hour and a half to, on subways to get there. And it five nights a week, and I was there for nine months. And then, when the war broke out, and I was about to be drafted, the chief engineer, I was working at WNBF as a telephone switchboard operator, okay, on weekends to get some money. I needed money. Um, he said to me, you know, you don't want to be drafted. You ought to join the Signal Corps Reserve, and you'll get an education, and it won't cost you a dime. But if you get drafted, you may end up in the infantry or you, wherever. You don't know where you're going to end up. So I took his advice. I, I joined the uh, Signal Corps Reserve. They sent me to a school in Philadelphia called Drexel Institute. Drexel Institute was the MIT of its day. They had the, the biggest and up-to-date laboratory of any colleges. And the Army sent me there for another eight months. And then when I got that under my belt, I had to go into active service. I mean, this, you, know, you knew that eventually <laughs> you were going to show up someplace. And when I got into that, after my basic training, they sent me to a, a place in New York City called Western Union. It's a telegraph telephone company, sends telegrams. Well, they had a cable between New York and London. They used to call it a submarine cable. It wasn't a submarine, but they used to call it a submarine cable. And the Army sent me there with 11 other guys, and we learned the technology of how to send stuff from New York to London, submarine cable. And that was another part of my education, okay? So my education was due to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's policies and the United States Signal Corps. And when I came out of the, uh, out of the service, I got a job at a station in Schenectady as a transmitter operator, and then I went from there on. Do you think a young person today <clears throat> might be good if they did what you did to go in the military? Or, or don't they, they must have transmitter engineers, they must have a lot of engineers, oh, yeah. whether they have oh, yeah. like sure they do. Yeah, the U.S. Signal Corps is still a big part of the Army because right. it's in charge of all the communications that right. take place. Right. And that's, if somebody wants to go that route, of course the old problem again is you, know, you, you want to go that route but you don't want to go into a war. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. you just want to do that. But there are <coughs> other means. There are, you know, right now we have community colleges, a two-year thing, and it's not as expensive as going to uh, uh, Tom, you went to Broome. Um, uh, do they have like the technical courses there? Absolutely. Yeah. Broome used to be called a Broome Tech right. in, in its earlier days. But even prior to that point, the the school districts and the the Board of Cooperative Education Services, the BOCES, offer more technical and hands-on skills that should apply to the um, <laughs> to the people that are interested in, in electronics and in the technical fields. And then after that, you can, and then pursue that. 
at perhaps Broome Community College yeah. and get into a more in-depth technical education for engineering. Yeah. And at that point, you have at least the basics to then select a field and make a, a decision as to what your what your employment will be. Let's come back to the uh, the local SBE chapter. Uh, now, Scott, what are some of the things that uh, SBE does on, on a on a local basis? Well, on a local basis, uh, being the founding chapter, I may want to add that chapter one. Um, we are proud to say we have probably. Uh, a lot of meetings throughout the year and we're consistent in having um, all 12 months you know planned out for we basically have the fellowship we have um, you know uh, distributors that will come in we have uh, representatives from many different electronics industry that will come in and it's a learning process and the thing about chapter one is we're consistent in having something going on every month um, the nice thing about it is you've got radio, you've got cable, you've got television, and you've got other factors of the media. And even if you're not familiar, we'll say you're in radio, and you're not familiar with TV, it's still a learning process. And that's why I've always been very interested in SBE and why Gino and Tom and the others that belong to Chapter 1 and other chapters go to these meetings. It's a learning process, and you, you've got to keep up with technology today. It is going fast. Uh, you kind of wonder, you know, where is it going to stop? I don't think it's going to stop. It's going to keep going fast. And so, you know, whatever you can do to learn, that is the secret, really. That's why we're there. How long have you been an SVE, Scott? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to figure, well, it's, it's been a while. Um, I think it's going on 15, 16 years now, anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, so. Tom? 1968. 68? Yeah. You've been there a while. Yes. Rick, you, you started in... 64. 64. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, are, are most of the members then older? Or do you have some of the, some younger engineering types there? I, a large majority are older. But we're getting an, a slow influx of younger people. Yes, we are. Uh, okay. Well, I was just thinking about John Skeptura. He's no, no, he's a younger guy. Uh, uh, so I guess, uh, I, I guess radio stations used to have to have somebody on duty 24 hours a day, or or, well, or whenever the station was on yeah, here, right? Yeah. And uh, and then I guess it went from there to having announcers. Do the uh, uh, yeah every half hour you do, you do the readings right you don't you didn't dare well, miss it everything has changed you have voiceover today you have uh, programs that are being pre-recorded and they insert the the audio at some other point in time and then they play it back and a lot of jobs have been eliminated there's no doubt mm -hmm. and and you also have station or GMs general managers that um, are taking I would probably say shortcuts, but it's not, it's the way the world today is how to produce something and uh, with less amount of people involved. Yeah. And that is becoming more and more prominent day by day. And a lot of folks don't know that you know, when they hear somebody, that person could be out on the beach somewhere. So he's already done his job three days ago. Yeah and they do video insertion, <laughs> yeah. and they just put something ahead, and they always queue, and, and they know. I, I, I talked with an engineer that said, said he, and I was, now this is going back a few years, but I was really amazed when he said, well, they'll, if, if the station goes off the air and my phone rings, yes. and then he has numbers that he would call to put the station back on the air. Uh -huh. Or, wow, isn't that something? And now apparently it happens. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah, well, otherwise you got to drive out there yes. and do it. Now, one other thing that I noticed um, a couple of years ago, there was a flood in Owego, mainly. Well, not mainly, but Owego was hit pretty hard. And, and I noticed that I, I'm assuming it was the SBE, and maybe it was individuals in the SBE, but the Owego radio station was underwater. Mm -hmm. Their 
their facilities are underwater. And some of your guys from the SBE, I believe, unless it was individuals, but still members of the SBE, went and helped them out. Yeah, uh, was, uh, the guy who did some work was a guy was named William Sitzman. He's a consultant, lives in Trumansburg. He came down and put up the temporary antenna for them to broadcast. So, SBE member, he was an SBE member, you know, helped them come back up. But they had their own people did most of the work, I guess. Mm -hmm. But that was an interesting development, and that's when SBE helped. Now, SBE has, uh, through the years, has had, for educational purposes, workshops, uh, seminars, and of course the monthly meetings where they bring in people uh, from equipment manufacturers plus people who are working on various aspects of the broadcast technology. So the SBE, because one of the things, every time I go to get a member to join, his first question is, what's the benefits? And the benefits are the educational benefits. The other ones are if your company does not offer health insurance, you can buy health insurance at reduced rates if you're a member. Uh, you can buy life insurance if you're a member. Um, so those are some of the benefits that has helps you go ahead in your career. And the certification program, of course, is the other uh, benefit if you want to take advantage of it. Um, but the workshops are all over the country, and now, now there are also uh, programs on the internet Unlike. that, that uh -huh. SBE has. And you gain some more information. Because as an engineer, if you're just going to sit there and not get your, your educational up to date, you're going to become a dinosaur. You're eventually going to be replaced by somebody who has that knowledge. So you can't just sit there and say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to worry about digital. I don't want to worry about color television. I don't want to worry about, now we got digital radio. I don't want to worry about those things. I'll let somebody else worry about it. Well, the first thing you know, he's out of work. Right. And he's, he's wondering why he's out of work. because. Today, the technology requires, most of it requires computer knowledge. I mean, there's no question. Most of the stuff on, in a studio today is computer driven. I mean, the equipment, what have you. Uh, the only thing that's not computer driven are the transmitters. They, they are still, the technology is still the same technology we had before, except now we got solid state instead of tubes. So the SBE has that benefit, plus these other side benefits that a member gets. Because the first thing, I don't know what the membership fee now, is it 50? 60? Well, no, well, no, it's 75 now. 75? Yeah, it was. 45? 75. 75 now. When I started, it was 15 bucks, okay. <laughs> but. Well, that was probably a lot of money then. Yeah. But the thing is, most of the managements would pay for your membership. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now today, that's not the case all the time because the budgets are so, so, are, are so tight. But when you think about it, 75 bucks out of a total budget that a station has is, is petty cash. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. but they still say, well, I don't know what benefits I'm going to get if I pay your membership. Well, that's a pretty stupid question, but that's the one I hear from managers when I went to try to get a guy a membership. I won't even tell you who the manager was. <laughs> I can guess. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I said to myself, well, gee, you know, if you can't afford the 75 bucks or whatever it was at the time, it's a great investment in your career. I mean, that's a small investment. You know, it's nothing. So, but the question always boils down to what are the benefits? So I say, well, come to a couple of meetings. You can come to meetings, you don't have to be a member. 
and find out what you think is the benefit. Um, now, the SBE also <laughs> has... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was going to say, gonna say, gonna say we also have a, a great magazine called A Signal, and yeah. that comes out on a monthly uh, basis, and it's a very well-written magazine. And for those that are starting out in the trade, it's a good way of getting their hands in the, into the things, into the pie, so to speak. But a lot of good technical articles along the way. And also showing new equipment. And if I might want to add, and it was highlighted, the Expo, uh, which is coming up in September. Uh, it's a very great way of going up and seeing what's going on. Because you're going to see a catalyst of everything, from transmitting um, to uh, video processing, to uh, tower lights. Tower lights. Oh, I, I was just thinking the last, I guess the next to last meeting I went to uh, was on new equipment. I think it was a, an NAB review. Uh -huh. And I was really impressed with a camera that they had set up there. And I don't know if they're in widespread use today, but I, it was demonstrated that if you are shooting, so let's say a car race, with this camera, and you see, if you want to concentrate on accidents, right? So you see an accident, you push a record button, and you started recording 10 seconds before. I said, wow, isn't that amazing? And you say, ah, a basketball game. If, if you were doing sports on television and you're at a basketball and you just want to show just want to show the baskets you know like the winning basket and stuff like that so you just follow the action and there's a basket and you push a button and it records starting 15 seconds before I, I said how do they do that so I, to me that was that was quite educational and that, that I guess has been a couple years so I guess people have figured that out. <laughs> I was impressed with with that kind of equipment. Of course, you guys were interested in the latest in transmitters and, and things like that. We have to fix it all. Yeah. We have to touch it. Yeah. So having that vast and a very general knowledge is is a big advantage for the companies we work for. Right. And the electronics and the computers are all coming into play in all this equipment. Sure. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to uh, to mention the officers in the SBE Chapter One. Our president is a radio state radio TV station engineer, and that's Eric Alder. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Oh boy, Adler. Adler, Eric Adler. Okay. And Scott is the secretary of the treasurer. And the vice president is Jim Pratt. And is, Jim, uh, Jim, Pratt? Jim Pratt. Jim is a recent retiree from the uh, cable system, cable industry. Right. And uh, and he also is in charge of your correspondence, I guess. Well, he does. Uh, he's a webmaster. Uh -huh. And uh, and Gino is uh, is has been the uh, educational person for many years. Uh -huh. Yeah. Also. Free, I was, until a year ago, I turned it over. I was the frequency coordinator for Ithaca, Elmira, Binghamton. The SP, frequency yeah, coordinator? Uh, yeah, the <coughs> SPE started this up mainly the football games. There's a bunch of frequencies being used during those football games for various pickup of some of the video, some of the audio, and they had to make sure that those frequencies did not interfere with the uh, microwave uh, frequencies that radio stations use to get the signal from the studio to the transmitter. Oh. TV stations use this, the same that frequency. That could be a mess. Okay. Yes. So I, you have to oh. keep track of yeah. And every time somebody went for, wanted a frequency, they'd have to check with me or their local yeah. frequency coordinator. And I kept records, okay? Uh -huh. I did this for 30-some uh, years, and I turned it over to this fellow called Will, uh, William uh, Sitzman, who was in Trumansburg, 
and he's now been doing it for a year because I decided that um, I just wanted to do less <laughs> in my career. Well, you know, that's a, I wish I had known that. <laughs> One time I walked in, I was going to, to tape a ceremony, and I asked the person in charge um, if they had a, a, a wireless microphone. And uh, she said, oh, yes, but we won't be using it for the ceremony. Well, she said they won't be using it, but she didn't say it wasn't turned on. So I walked in that day, an hour before the ceremony, and I turned my mic on, and I said, testing, one, two, three. I sounded great coming through the speakers. <laughs> so that's a great idea. And so, but you've been doing it coordinating with the radio and television stations. Yeah, well, so. the biggest uh, events that I had, that I got requests for frequency was when they do the golf thing at Endicott, the golf championship. BC Open, okay. yeah, where it was. And the other one is the races at Watkins Glen. Oh. And these guys would come in and give me a list of frequencies that they wanted to use. Some of them were for audio, some of them were for the blimp down, Whoa. okay, the television thing. So I had a record of all the frequencies that were being used in this area, and I made sure that the frequencies they wanted, if, if they were going to interfere with somebody, I would have to say, you can't use that, you got to go to a different one. And I'd give them the, the new one they could go to, and I kept doing this for every time that we had championship, we had the uh, Watkins Glen, and there was one other event that we don't have anymore, and I'm trying to think of what it was, but I can't give it to you right now. But the main thing the SBE was involved in was football games. Football games use a ton of frequencies, sometimes anywhere from 13 to 50 different frequencies to cover the event. And when we went to Super Bowl, you even had a bigger oh, yeah. amount of stuff. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> because and the people doing those games not only used the frequency that they were actually using, they wanted a backup one in case sure. the other one quit. So you would have a whole bunch of these frequencies. So the SBE started this, uh, oh, a good 30 years ago, when the NFL came to them and said, we got to have somebody do this. Sure. Now, besides this, you not only had to give them a frequency, they have to apply for a license. I mean, you just don't say, well, here's the frequency. You have to go get a license, right. or you got to tell the commission to get a temporary license to operate on these various frequencies. So that was another thing that the SBE did. It worked out very well, right. and we never had any interferences, problems. Although a couple I of can times. just imagine, I can just imagine all of these guys showing up at the same time and not having this frequency separation oh, thing. Yeah, well, it well, would be a real mess, oh, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be a disaster. You'd hear one coach talking to the yeah. other coach. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it wouldn't only be that, you wouldn't hear anything. Right. Once you have interference, you know, you know nothing happens. Yeah, wow. So that was one of the things that the SBE did. And well, the other thing the SBE has, have a store, a bookstore. You can buy books that, some of them are written by people in the SBE and other books are written by other people. And you can buy books at a reduced rate. Uh, in fact, um, last week I turned over eight of my books that I had bought to uh, Melnick, who's the chief engineer of WICD, because most of the books are on digital technology. And I never hesitated to buy a book to learn what the next bit was, because that to me was the only way I could keep up with what was going on. And uh, so they have a bookstore, and uh, let's see, and of course he talked about Signal. It's a bi-monthly newsletter, uh -huh. and it has a lot of information, plus it also uh, keeps up with people who are retiring, you know, things of that nature, and that would be in that bi-monthly. So the SBE has done a lot of work 
and has been successful, and it continues to do a lot of work because it's the edu engineers have to. You can't just say to yourself, "I know everything that I'm ever going to know." You have to upgrade your education, and you have to do that. My wife had a great. My wife was a great reader of mystery um, stories. She loved mystery stories. She, I, wanted, I had a ton of books that she did. And she used to say to me, why don't you read one of these mysteries? <laughs> I said, no, I, have time. I haven't got time because I've got to read this technical stuff that I've got in front of me. <laughs> so she'd say, okay, that's an excuse that she used. <laughs> eventually I started to read a couple of them. But I wasn't a great reader of mystery novels, so so the, the bookstore was a great place to go to. And uh, every year they had a thing called an engineering handbook. It's about that thick, and it came out every year. It was published by McGraw Hill, who, by the way, uh, my master sergeant went to work for McGraw Hill when he got out of the army. I mean that's how I associate McGraw Hill. Um, so, uh, it, uh, so the SBE has done a great job since 1964 to date, and these two gentlemen are going to keep it going, and, go. uh, and their successors will keep it going, and uh, I hope, hope for that the SBE just grows. It's got 5,000 members now uh, throughout the That's country. throughout the world, then. Yeah, throughout the world and, and the country. And it's got some new, it keeps getting new chapters. In fact, there's a new chapter that was started in Ithaca. <clears throat> so new chapters are being done, started, and uh, it's still flourishing. And it was a good thing for us to break away back in 1964 from that big engineering society that was mainly <coughs> IBM or telephone people and things of that nature. So when we started our own, and John Battison, I think he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, he was an Englishman who came to this country he, and, uh, and started his consulting firm down in Washington. And the SBE, talking about Washington, the SBE has um, always commented, filed comments to any new regulation or any changes that the commission is thinking about doing, because every time the commission comes up with a uh, new regulation, they give 30 days for you to make comments, anybody, public, anybody can make comments on it. In fact, there's a whole slew of comments now on the so-called repackaging. The repackaging of television uh, stations, what the commission is doing, the telephone companies claim they need more frequencies for Wi-Fi and whatever they're going to do. And they claim they need it in the band that television is. They say that the band is not being used efficiently. So the commission, I think it's next year, is going to come out with a plan, what they call repackaging. What they're going to do is move frequencies closer together. Uh, but the problems with moving them closer together are interference problems. So that has to be all worked out. So what's going to happen is some stations are going to ch have to change channels. Uh, I don't know if we're going to change any here because we're <coughs> the big places are New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, where there, there are many, many, many television stations. And so the SBE has filed various comments on that particular program saying what's going to happen. Because the other thing they're going to do is the, ch the frequencies that they will have, they're going to auction off to telephone companies. Supposedly bring in billions of dollars. This is going to lower our, our, <laughs> our debt, but it's only going to bring in about the last thing I saw was about three and a half, four billion dollars, which is not going to do much to reduce our debt. So that's what's going to take place, and it may take place next year, if not the year after that. So 
uh, one of the comments that SBE made was, you just, we've just gone into the digital stuff, and it's cost stations billions, money, quite a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know. And now you're asking us to change channels, we have to buy new antennas, we have to buy additional equipment, so we think it's the wrong time to do this. But the pressure from the phone companies is so great, their lobby people are doing a job that they keep claiming that they need this because they're saying this will allow all the people in the country to have access to broadband internet, okay? They don't come up with a lot of people, even if there's broadband available, they don't have the money to go to broadband. It's like today, <clears throat> one of the big things is the telephone companies are saying that we don't need off-air transmissions anymore. Whoops. Okay? <laughs> Television. Talk about. We don't need that because there's not enough people watching off-air anymore. Well, a survey was taken. 20% of the people in this country still get their television off-air. They're not on satellite. They're not on cable. Main reason for that is the economy. They can't afford it. Right. Plus the people who are making less than the poverty level, which is $24,000, they can't afford it. Right. They can about afford to put food on the table, let alone worry about it. So all they can afford is buy a, they usually have a pretty old television. A lot of these people still have black and white televisions. Right. And uh, they have a you know, a fairly small amount. You could buy a, a small receiver for $100, $150. And uh, so these people would be denied television, which means not only be denied entertainment, they'd be denied the warnings that television puts out during storm warnings, floods, tor tornadoes, what have you. We have this system called EAS, which you see a thing come across the screen and it tells you You've seen it, the local uh, weather bureau puts out a thing. It kills the audio that you're watching, which makes some people upset. <laughs> but it's giving you flooding information, <clears throat> stuff like that. So to say, well, we don't need this off the air stuff, that's just somebody sitting in some office who's making Two million a year of salary saying you don't need this stuff, okay? But you do need it. And I'm a great proponent of free television. Right now, if you can't afford um, satellite or cable, you can get nine channels off the air, nine different channels of pro uh, programming. And because uh, BNG has two channels. ICZ has two channels, SKG has three channels, and 34 has two channels. So you put all these together, you say to yourself, well, is that going to give me enough entertainment? Well, I don't know, it's everybody's particular uh, thought. Because the next question I always ask is, who the hell needs 200 channels? <laughs> How can you watch 200 channels? What are you doing? You're not doing anything else in your life? <laughs> you know, so that's one of the things that this repackaging thing is, is everybody is concerned about, <clears throat> that we don't <clears throat> just kill television off air. Now, radio stations are not dealing with this problem, but they will be someday. Some I would bright think. guy is going to come out and say, there's spaces on the television band that's not being used. Why don't we use this for whatever, okay? So SBE is highly involved in this process, and we're going to see what comes out, comes next year. Okay, well, uh, uh, anybody have another comment to, I think we'll no, wrap this up. I, Did you have I, something I else? I agree with uh, Gino, I mean, he said it right, the nail on the head there, the, uh, Pretty much everything uh, 
is getting so advanced and everybody wants to take, again, I mentioned shortcuts, but that's true. Um, it's, um, I guess, up to the younger generation to decide if they'd like to get into our... Well, I want to thank you very much for coming over and telling us about uh, SVE. Um, Gina Riccadelli, Tom Seglin, and Scott Phillips. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. You must remember this A kiss is still a kiss A sigh is just a sigh The fundamental thing Fly as time goes by And when two lovers woo they still say I love you, and that you can rely.